Hare Krishna devotees, welcome to day 26 of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam, day 26 on uh, Canto 2, and we're in the 8th chapter, uh, which is about Pradikshit's questions to Shukadev Goswami. And we almost finished the chapter yesterday, not quite. So we're starting uh, today with the last section, verse 27 to verse 29. Shukadev Goswami begins answering Parikshit. And so it's just three verses, 27, 28, 29. And then we'll move on to chapter 9. But first of all, our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shemati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharne Nira Vishesha Shunyavadi Pastya Chadeja Tarne Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramunityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shivas Adi Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> Vanchkapa Tarubias Chaya Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Paditanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Right, so the section is titled Shukadev Goswami begins answering Parikshit. It's verse 27 to 29. So here's verse 27. Sutta Goswami said, Thus Shukadev Goswami, <coughs> being invited by Maharaj Parikshit to speak on topics of the Lord Sri Krishna with the devotees, was very much pleased. <coughs> Right, so Prabhupada begins the purport by explaining that the only legitimate discussion, he says, uh, on Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is discussion among the devotees. It's the only proper legitimate discussion. As, as Bhagavad Gita was discussed between Krishna and Arjuna, so similarly, Bhagavatam can only be discussed between people like Shukadev and Parikshit. Otherwise, I mean, of course, anyone can try and discuss it if they want. <clears throat> but the taste of nectar will not be there unless they are um, proper people like Shukadev and Parikshit. Right, so... Shukadeva is pleased with Parikshit, that he's not tired of hearing about the Lord, that he wants to hear more and more. Uh, yes, so that's, that's the result of proper speaking and proper hearing. Otherwise, Prabhupada points out that foolish interpreters, the way he puts it, unnecessarily tackle Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam <coughs> when they have no access to the subject matter. So it's all pointless. And Prabhupada notes that therefore Shankaracharya, the famous impersonalist Mayavadi, didn't touch Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada makes the point that Shankaracharya, in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita, he, he accepted Krishna as the Supreme Lord. But then later he commented uh, from the impersonalist perspective. But still he didn't comment on the Bhagavatam. So that's the first paragraph, and there's a short second paragraph 
that uh, Shukadev Goswami <coughs> was protected by Lord Krishna. This is in, I mean, it's, uh, it's to be found in Brahma Vaivata Purana, actually. And therefore he's known as Brahma Rata. The term is there in the third line of the Sanskrit of the, of the verse. Vishnu Rata means he's protected by Vishnu. So, and of course, devotees are all always protected by the Lord. Uh, and, and it's also clear that <coughs> a Vishnu Rata should, should hear Srimad Bhagavatam from a Brahma Rata. Yeah. <coughs> Shukadeva is Brahma Rata. Parikshit is Vishnu Rata. So Vishnu Rata, one who's protected by Vishnu, should hear from a Brahma Rata, one who's protected by Krishna and no one else. Verse 28, he began to reply to the inquiries of Maharaj Parikshit by saying that the science of the personality of Godhead was spoken first by the Lord himself to Brahma when he was first born. <coughs> Srimad Bhagavatam is the supplementary Vedic literature and it is just in pursuance of the Vedas. Just a sec. Right, okay. And there's a short purport, fairly short. Prabhupada explains Bhagavatam is the science of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Impersonalists try to misrepresent the personal feature of the Lord. Um, that, because they don't know the science. They don't know the science. They don't know the position <coughs> of the Bhagavatam. So if one wants to learn it, you have to, one has to take shelter of a representative of Shukadev and, and then follow in the footsteps of Parikshit if you want to learn the Bhagavatam. Otherwise, if, if you take shelter of some unqualified person and or if you're not following in the footsteps of Parikshit, there, there will be offenses. Prabhupada says uh, one will commit a great offense at the feet of the Lord. So, and, and this program of misinterpretations by non-devotees, Prabhupada says, has played havoc in understanding Srimad Bhagavatam. Just such havoc, it's incredible actually. Uh, yes, so therefore the careful student following Parikshit must always be alert to this if he really wants to learn the science of Godhead properly. And verse 20 Nine. He also prepared himself to reply to all that King Parikshit had inquired from him. Maharaj Parikshit was the best in the dynasty of the Pandus, and thus he was able to ask the right questions from the right person. And a short purport that... Parikshit asked many questions, but Prabhupada makes the interesting point. 
It's not necessary for the spiritual master to answer the, all those questions in the order they're asked. Yes. Um, so, so Prabhupada concludes the short purport by saying, but Shukadev Goswami, experienced teacher that he was, answered all the questions in a systematic way as they were received from the chain of disciplic succession. And he answered all of them without exception. That's really nice. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 8. And we go on now to chapter 9, which is titled Answers by Citing the Lord's Version. And there are seven sections here. Let's just quickly run through them. <clears throat> First section from verse 1 to verse 3, Shukadev continues answering Parikshit's questions. Shukadev continues answering Shukadev's questions. Then the second section from verse 4 to verse 8, Shukadev describes Brahma's experience and realization. Shukadev describes Brahma's experience and realization, verse 4 to verse 8. Then the third section, from verse 9 to verse 19, the Lord reveals Vaikuntha to Brahma. The Lord reveals Vaikuntha to Brahma, verse 9 to verse 19. Then the fourth section, the Lord addresses Brahma, verse 20 to verse 24. The Lord addresses Brahma, 20 to 24. But then the fifth section, verse 25 to verse 30, Brahma responds to the Lord. <coughs> and the sixth section from 31 to 37, very interesting and important, the Chatur Shloki Srimad Bhagavatam, the, the essence of the Bhagavatam, in, in other words, the essence of the Bhagavatam spoken by Krishna to Brahma. And the seventh and last section, uh, verse 38 to verse 46, Shukadev describes events after the Lord disappears from the vision of Brahma, at least. Yeah, verse 38 to verse 46. Shukadev describes events after the Lord disappears. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let us get into it then by reading the verses of verse, verse 1 to verse 3. The section being Shukadev continues answering Parikshit's questions. Verse 1, Sri Shukadev Goswami said, O King, unless one is influenced by the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there's no meaning to the relationship of the pure soul in pure consciousness with the material body. That relationship is just like a dreamer's seeing his own body working. And verse 2, the illusioned living entity appears in so many forms offered by the external energy of the Lord. While enjoying in the modes of material nature, the encaged living entity misconceives, thinking of, in terms of I and mine. And verse 3, as soon as the living entity becomes situated in his constitutional glory and begins to enjoy the transcendence beyond time and material energy, 
He at once gives up the two misconceptions of life, I and mine, and thus becomes fully manifested as the pure self. So devotees, now we will go through the, uh, this first section uh, in full, uh, including the, uh, the purports. So Parikshit had asked in uh, chapter 8 or previously, Parikshit asked how the living entity uh, began his material life. Uh, although he, he is apart from the material body and mind. So here, Prabhupada points out, Shukadev, here with, in this verse, gives the perfect answer, uh, which is the soul is distinct from the material conception of his life, but becomes absorbed in that conception because of the influence of the material energy known as Atma Maya. And of course, this has already actually been explained in the first canto regarding uh, Vyasa's realization of the Lord and the, the external energy of the Lord. So, <clears throat> Continuing um, Shukadev's perfect answer to the question, the external energies controlled by the Lord and the living entities are controlled by the external energy, by the will of the Lord. And therefore, as the verse says, although the living entity is purely conscious in the pure state, but... Um, he is subordinate to the will of the Lord uh, in the sense now of being influenced by the external energy. And Srila Prabhupada refers to Bhagavad Gita 1515, uh, which confirms the same thing, that the Lord is present within the heart of every living entity, and all the living entities' consciousness and forgetfulness are influenced by the Lord. That's interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, so the second paragraph. The next question then would automatically be, why the Lord influences the living entity uh, to such consciousness and forgetfulness? And the answer is... Um, the Lord wants the living entities to be in pure consciousness as his parts and parcels and in that way be engaged in devotional service. But because we have our, what Prabhupada refers to, uh, we have our partial independence, we may not be willing to do that. We may not be willing to serve the Lord, but rather would prefer to try to be independent, as independent as the Lord. And as Prabhupada has mentioned many times already and will mention many times following this, the, the non-devotees, living entities, they want to be as powerful as the Lord, although they're just not fit. They're, they're just illusioned by the will of the Lord because they want to become like him. Uh, yes, and it's like someone, Prabhupada says, um, who wants to become the king, but without the qualification. So, we're, so therefore we're put into a dreaming condition dreaming that, oh, we are like that. It's interesting, isn't it? So therefore, Prabhupada makes the point, the first sinful will 
of the living entity is to become the Lord. And the consequent will of the Lord is that the living entity forgets his real life and dreams of utopia where he can become like the Lord. I mean, we should note this very carefully, that first of all, the living entity desires to become the Lord. And then when that happens, then the Lord desires and, and puts into effect that, that then we forget our real life and dream of some utopian situation where we are like the Lord. And Prabhupada gives uh, an example that is also given in a few occasions. A child may cry to the mother to get the moon, but or so the mother gives the child a mirror and the child can see the mirror in, I mean, the moon in the mirror and think that the child has the moon. So, but in both cases, in the case of the living entity wanting to become the Lord, in the case of the child wanting the moon, it's just dreaming illusions only. And Prabhupada makes a very important point. We don't need, there's no need to trace out when this all started. Um, but as soon as it did, we were put under the control of Atma, excuse me, Atma Maya, by the direction of Krishna. And we still are. Of course, of course, by the grace of the Lord, we at least as devotees have been given the opportunity to become Krishna conscious. So we are better off than just being in total illusion, but we've still got a way to go. Therefore, we're doing Bhakti Vai Bhava. <laughs> so therefore, anyway, therefore, because we're under the control of Atma Maya, we're dreaming this is mine and this is I, yeah, my body. And Prabhupada makes the point that uh, this continues life after life. As long as the living entity is not purely conscious of his identity, according to, this, to, to his identity as the subordinate part and parcel of the Lord. Right. So there's a third um, there's a third paragraph which oh well it's extremely short one sentence <clears throat> in his pure consciousness however there is no such misconceived dream and in that pure conscious state the living entity does not forget that he is never the Lord but that, but that he is eternally the servitor of the Lord in transcendental love. Right. So, okay. Actually, I, yeah, okay. So I'll just go straight on to verse 2. The illusioned living entity appears in so many forms offered by the external energy of the Lord. While enjoying in the modes of material nature, the encaged living entity misconceives, thinking in terms of I and mine. So, um, so Prabhupada gets into this, the different forms of the living entities, there are different dresses offered by Maya according to the different modes we want to enjoy. And of course, there are three modes. We all know goodness, passion, ignorance. So, so when we, so e, Prabhupada says, so even, even in material nature, we have a chance to independently choose different types of bodies. 
they're different species on different planets and we're traveling around transmigrating as per the modes based on our enjoying spirit uh, so then in in one body we go through the different stages of childhood youth etc through the lifetime of that body and then on to another body and Srila Prabhupada lists out all the different types of bodies you can just see there in the purport. <coughs> yeah, see uh, fish bodies, vegetable bodies, and, and so on and so forth. Birds, beasts, humans. Right. So, for example, um, Uh, we, we create a body, effectively we create a body through personal desire, external energy supplies it, so we can enjoy our desires as much as possible. And Prabhupada gives the example of a tiger, wants to enjoy the blood of another animal, and there, therefore by the grace of the Lord, the material energy gives him the body of the tiger, which is just right for, for doing that. And similarly, someone wants the body of a demigod, and by the grace of the Lord, they can get that also. But if someone's intelligent enough, he'll desire to get a spiritual body to uh, enjoy the company of the Lord, and he'll get it. So this minute independence of the living entity can be utilized. And the Lord is so kind, he gives the body that we desire as we utilize our independence. But it's all just within the, the framework of dreaming. So Prabhupada points out that our desiring like this <coughs> is like dreaming of a golden mountain. There is gold, there's a mountain. Somehow the two impressions get put together and we, we dream of a golden mountain. And after dreaming, um, <clears throat> we see that, uh, we, we see something else. Yes. So, when we're awake, we see there's neither gold nor a mountain. What to speak of a golden mountain? And second paragraph. So these misconceptions, uh, these positions at least, are due to misconceptions of mine and I. <clears throat> and so the karami, the materialist, thinks the world is mine and Gyani thinks I am everything and they both get illusioned in their different ways. So the whole material conception <clears throat> of politics, sociology, etc. is based on this misconceived mine and I, which are products of the strong desire to enjoy material life. And um, identification with the body and place of birth comes under the direct conceptions of socialism, nationalism, etc., due to forgetfulness of our real nature. But the good news is, Prabhupada tells us, that this can be removed. This misconception can be removed by the association of Shukadev. Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit, as explained in the Bhagavatam. <clears throat> and verse 3, as soon as the living entity becomes situated in his constitutional glory and, be and begins to enjoy the transcendence beyond time and material energy, he at once gives up the two 
misconceptions of life, which are, of course, I and mine, and thus become fully manifested as the pure self. So just see, just see how uh, these things are being answered so systematically and, and comprehensively. So Srila Prabhupada explains uh, that these two misconceptions of I and mine are manifested in two classes of people. In the lower state, mine is more prominent, and in the higher state, I is more prominent. And Prabhupada makes interesting point that in the animal state, mine is perceivable even amongst the animals who fight with each other over that this is mine and someone, the other one thinks, no, this is mine. Yes. Uh, and in lower human life, that's the way Prabhupada puts it, in the lower stage of human life, the same thing is there. My house, my country, my family, and all these types of things, my caste. But in the higher state, the misconception of mine is then changed. It's transformed into I, I am, or it's all I am, etc. So, in other words, this is in the stage of speculative knowledge. Speculative knowledge or more like the impersonal stage of life in one form or another. <clears throat> so Prabhupada points out, many classes of men who have the con misconception of I and mine in different, have uh, in different colors, and but the real significance of I can only be realized in the consciousness, I'm the eternal servant of the Lord, and which is pure consciousness. And all the Vedic literatures are teaching us this conception of life. So, next paragraph. Uh, all very interesting. The misconception of I am, I am the Lord or I am supreme. Prabhupada says it's more dangerous than conceptions of mine, which are found in the lower stages, even the animals. So, so e even though the Vedas sometimes talk of oneness with the Lord, uh, we have to get, be clear that it doesn't mean in all respects. There's, there's oneness in certain respects. It's a fact. But ultimately we're subordinate to the, to the Lord and we're meant to satisfy his senses. So, so he says, um, the Lord says that we should surrender to him. So if we were not subordinate to him, why would he ask that? Yeah, if we were actually equal to him, then how come we are put under the influence of Maya? That's a good question. <coughs> so can a living entity who claims to be as good as the supreme control material nature? Yeah, why would the Lord ask that? Can, uh, they, would, they, they would say, they would say in the future we will be, which is nonsense. Be as good as, be, be able to control material nature. So, so even if someone says, yes, in the future I can control material nature, why are they not in control of it now? So Prabhupada's exploring all these points. 
And Bhagavad Gita uh, explains that we can we can become freed from the control of material nature by surrender. <clears throat> but if there's no surrender, the living entity will never be able to control material nature. So we have to give up the misconception of I, I am, by practicing devotional service. Yes, yes. So, uh, and brother gives a nice example. Some poor unemployed, unemployed person may have problems in life, but if he gets a good job with the government, he becomes happy. And there's, what's the gain in denying the supremacy of the Lord? There's no gain. One should rather be situated in one's natural glory as the servant of the Lord. <coughs> so, in conditioned life, we're servants of Maya. In liberated life, we're servants of the Lord. Prabhupada con concludes the paragraph by saying, to become untinged by the modes of material nature is the qualification for entering into the service of the Lord. As long as one is a servant of mental concoctions, one cannot be completely free from the disease of I and mine. And then the third paragraph. This is quite a major purport because it's a very important subject. So Prabhupada begins third paragraph. The supreme truth is uncontaminated by Maya because he controls Maya. Whereas the relative truths, that was the supreme truth, but the relative truths, including us, uh, are apt to be engrossed in Maya. So best thing is to face the supreme truth directly, like you can face the sun. When the sun is up, it's full of life, but when it's down, there's darkness. Similarly, when we face the Lord, uh, we can be freed from illusion. And when we're not facing him, we're in darkness. And this is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 14.26. Yes, which then Prabhupada explains in the fourth paragraph. So, the science of bhakti yoga, worshipping the Lord, glorifying him, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from the right sources and associating with pure devotees, should be adopted in all earnestness. We shouldn't be misled by these misconceptions of I and mine. So, to be very specific, Prabhupada makes the point, the karmis are fond of mine, and the jnanis are fond of I. Yes, of the misconceptions of mine, the karmis and the jnanis, the misconception of I. And they're both unqualified to be freed from bondage to maya, so they're not freed. <coughs> and Srimad Bhagavatam, and Prabhupada says primarily Bhagavad Gita are both meant to deliver people from I and mine. You know, because why, why Bhagavad Gita primarily? Because in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is emphasizing so much how we're not these bodies. We're eternal spirit souls. And we are servants of the Lord. All the very foundational information on that subject. So, right, so we have to become situated in the transcendental position where there's no influence of time, 
nor of the material energy. Otherwise, in material life, we're subject to time. Uh, in, in the dream of past, present, and future. Then the speculators ultimately means the impersonalists try to conquer time's influence by speculating on becoming the Lord, by the culture of knowledge and conquering the ego. But this is imperfect. The perfect process is to accept Krishna as the Supreme and then surrender to him. And only in this way can you get rid of the misconception of I and mine. And of course, both Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam confirm this. So Srila Prabhupada concludes this extensive purport by saying, <coughs> Srila Vyasadeva has specifically contributed to the illusioned living entities, the science of God and the process of Bhakti Yoga, in his great literature, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the conditioned soul should fully take advantage of this great science. So that's the end of the first section. And now we go on to the second section, uh, which is from verse 4 to verse 8, and is titled, Shukadev describes Brahma's experience and realization. So, first of all, I'll just read the verses. O King, the personality of Godhead, being very much pleased with Lord Brahma because of his non-deceptive penance and bhakti yoga, presented his eternal and transcendental form before Brahma, and that is the objective goal for purifying the conditioned soul. Verse 5, Lord Brahma, the first spiritual master, supreme in the universe, could not trace out the source of his lotus seat. And while thinking of creating the material world, he could not understand the proper direction for such creative work, nor could he find out the process for such creation. Verse 6, while thus engaged in thinking in the water, Brahmaji heard twice from nearby two syllables joined together. One of the syllables was taken from the 16th and the other from the 21st of the Sparsha alphabets and both joined to become the wealth of the renounced order of life. Verse 7, when he heard the sound, he tried to find the speaker searching on all sides. But when he was unable to find anyone besides himself, he thought it wise to sit down on his lotus seat firmly and give his attention to the execution of penance as he was instructed. And 8. Lord Brahma underwent penances for 1,000 years by the calculations of the demigods. He heard this transcendental vibration from the sky and he accepted it as divine. Thus he controlled his mind and senses and the penances he executed were a great lesson for the living entities. Thus he is known as the greatest of all ascetics. All right, so let's go through this section. Shukadev describes Brahma's experience and realization from verse 4 to verse 8. So the verse, verse 4, O King, the personality of Godhead, being very much pleased with Lord Brahma because of his non-deceptive penance in Bhakti Yoga, presented his eternal and transcendental form before Brahma, and that is the objective goal for purifying the conditioned soul. So Srila Prabhupada begins the purport by saying that Atmatattva, Atmatattva, uh, which is 
mentioned in the verse, the very first thing in the verse, uh, is the science of God. Atma Tattva is the science of God and the living entity. Both of them are known as Atma. But the Supreme Lord is Param Atma, Supreme Atma, and the living entity is just Atma, the Brahman or Jiva. So both Paramatma and Jivatma, being transcendental, are called Atma. So, so Shukadeva Goswami ha, is explaining this verse to purify the truth of both Paramatma and Jivatma. But Prabhupada makes the point very important. Generally, people have misconceptions about both. Yeah, Jivatma, they, they have the misconception, they identify the body with the soul, they identify themselves with the body, and re Paramatma, uh, regarding Paramatma, they think that Paramatma is on an equal level with the living entity. So both misconceptions, though, can be removed immediately by Bhakti Yoga. Krishna consciousness, just as in the sunlight, both the sun and the world are revealed in the sunlight. In the darkness, you can't see the sun and you can't see the world and everything in the world. So therefore, Shukadeva Goswami says that in order to purify, to become purified from both misconceptions, for us to become purified, the Lord has presented his eternal form before Brahma, being satisfied by his honest execution of bhakti yoga. And Prabhupada says in the last uh, sentence of this paragraph, except for bhakti yoga, any method for realization of atma tattva uh, or the science of Atma, will prove deceptive in the long run. Ah, gosh, that's such a critical point. So into the second paragraph, Krishna in Bhagavad Gita explains we can only know him perfectly through Bhakti Yoga. And that's what Brahma did. He undertook great penance in Bhakti Yoga and as a result saw the form of the Lord. That form, of course, is 100% spiritual and can only be seen after tapasya in pure Bhakti Yoga. So that form that Brahma saw was not a form of this world. He didn't do his tapasya in order to see some ordinary material form. So, therefore, Maharaj Pariksit's question about the form of the Lord, um, which was asked actually in the second canto, chapter 8, verse 8, as follows. This is the question from chapter 8, the immediate previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 8. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead from whose abdomen the lotus stem sprouted, if he is possessed of a gigantic body according to his own caliber and measurement, then what is the specific difference between the body of the Lord and those of common living entities? So anyway, the, I mean, there are a number of points, but the first one is, the Lord's form is Satchitananda, but our forms at this point now are not. That's the fundamental distinction. So Prabhupada concludes the paragraph by saying, the conditioned soul, however, can regain his form of eternal knowledge and bliss simply by seeing the Lord by means of Bhakti Yoga. So, then third paragraph, Prabhupada gives a summary of the, the subject matter. 
due to ignorance. The conditioned soul is encaged in the temporary varieties of material forms. But the Supreme Lord has no such temporary form like the conditioned souls. He's always possessed of an eternal form of knowledge and bliss. And that is the difference between the Lord and the living entity. So how are we going to understand that? We're going to understand that difference by Bhakti Yoga. And Prabhupada mentions how shortly in this paragraph um, the Lord is going to tell the, the basic gist of ba the Bhagavatam in four verses. We'll, we'll read those in a couple of days probably. So therefore, the Bhagavatam is not a creation of mental speculators. It's transcendental and it's, the sound is as good as that of the Vedas or even better, actually. Yeah. And the topic is the science of the Lord and the living entity. And regular reading and hearing of it is also part of Bhakti Yoga. And you can achieve perfection in Bhakti Yoga and Krishna consciousness simply by associating with Srimad Bhagavatam. So then Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, both Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit attain perfection through the medium of Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, Shukadev by, by uh, chanting it and Parikshit by hearing it. Verse 5, Lord Brahma, the first spiritual master, supreme in the universe, could not trace out the source of his lotus seat. And while thinking of creating the material world, he could not understand the proper direction for such creative work, nor could he find out the process for such creation. Yeah, so he had the idea of creating the world, but he just didn't understand uh, how to do it, what to do and what it was all about. So Prabhupada in the purport makes the point, this verse is the prelude for explaining the transcendental nature of the form and abode of the Lord. And Prabhupada notes that in the beginning of the Bhagavatam, the Supreme Absolute Truth was said to exist in his own abode, with, with, which had no touch of the deluding energy. And therefore that kingdom is not a myth or some fantasy. It's a real transcendental sphere of planets, the Vaikuntas. A really different situation to what we're used to. And this will also be explained in, in this chapter. So then the uh, second paragraph that this knowledge of the spiritual sky above the material sky can only be known by devotional service, nothing else. And even the, the, uh, the power of creation also came from bhakti yoga, from devotional service. In the beginning, he didn't know what to do, how to create. He had a feeling that he should create, but what to do about it. And he couldn't see also where he came from. But through bhakti yoga, devotional service, Krishna consciousness, he understood all of this. And he realized it all clearly. So similarly, by Bhakti Yoga, uh, we can know the Lord. And by knowing him as supreme, we can know everything else. Because if you know the supreme, you know everything else. So the first Brahma is the first spiritual master of the universe. Uh, was enlightened by the grace of the Lord. 
So, so who can attain perfect knowledge of everything without the Lord's mercy? Nobody. So if we want to know everything, we must seek for the mercy of the Lord. Uh, n- not, not by trying any other way. And Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, to seek knowledge on the strength of one's personal attempt is a sheer waste of time. Verse 6, while thus engaged in thinking in the water, Brahmaji heard twice from nearby two syllables joined together. One of the syllables was taken from the 16th and the other from the 21st of the Sparsha alphabets and both joined to become the wealth of the renounced order of life. So here Prabhupada explains that um, he explains some points about the Sanskrit alphabet and how it works and how this this term that these two s- syllables ta and pa tapa how tapa is formed tapa means penance yes so Prabhupada explains though about the the formation the the system of the alphabet amongst the consonants they're divided into two divisions, Sparsha and ta- Talavya. From Ka to Ma, the letters are known as the Sparsha Varanas, and the 16th of the group is called Ta, whereas the 21st is called Pa. So when they're joined together, the word Tapa or penance is constructed. And this penance is the beauty and wealth of the Brahmins and the renounced order. So, and Prabhupada points out, according to Bhagavat philosophy, the philosophy of the Bhagavatam, every human is meant only for tapa, only, and nothing else. uh, Because by tapa one can uh, realize the self. And ultimately, the Supreme Self. And that, that is the business of life and not sense gratification. Yes, uh, by, by tapasya. So this tapasya began from the beginning of the creation and was first adopted by Lord Brahma himself. And it's the only way, tapasya is the only way we can get any profit from the human life, not by polished animal life. Amazing. So Prabhupada concludes the paragraph by saying, the animal doesn't know anything except sense gratification in the jurisdiction of eat, drink, be merry, and enjoy. But the human being is meant to undergo tapasya for going back to Godhead back home. Right, so now the second paragraph, because uh, here we are, we are, it's being explained to us, the, the, uh, the title of this section from four to eight is, Shukadeva is describing Brahma's experience and his realization. So, right, on we go in the second paragraph then. Uh, He was perplexed, so what to do? He decided to climb down the stem of the lotus, and then he heard tapa twice. Yes. So, taking the path of tapa, austerity, is, is the second birth of the desiring disciple. Uh, yes, and Prabhupada explains the word in the, the verse, apasrinot, is significant 
because it's similar to Upanayan or bringing the disciple closer to the spiritual master in order to do tapasya. So therefore this means Brahma was initiated by in the Krishna mantra by the Lord himself and Brahma Samhita confirms that. Because here, I mean, there's certain details in this whole process which is being described, which may not all be uh, spelt out here in the Bhagavatam. So, yes, yeah, so Brahma, so Brahma Samhita then confirms all of this, that Brahma was initiated by the Lord. And therefore Brahma became a devotee first before creating the universe. Yes. Uh, and Brahma Samhita says he was initiated uh, by the 18-letter Krishna mantra. And this is accepted by all devotees, including the Brahma Sampradaya. So then Prabhupada lists out some of the devotees in our parampara who accepted the same principle. Finally, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada's own spiritual master. So then the third paragraph, one who's initiated in this way can achieve the same result as Brahma, or meaning the power of creation. Yes. So, and he, Prabhupada says, chanting of this holy mantra is the only shelter of the de desireless pure devotee of the Lord. And simply by such tapasya the devotee achieves all perfection just like Brahma did. Okay, so on we go to verse 7. When he heard the sound, he tried to find the speaker searching on all sides. But when he was unable to find anyone besides himself, he thought it wise to sit down on his lotus seat firmly and give his attention to the execution of penance as he was instructed. So devotees, you know, to do this justice, I think we're going to have to finish here and carry on tomorrow from this point. We'll get into verse 7 again tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.